If you want to be loved, you need to be yourself. This piece of advice offered in slightly altered forms depending on whether one is seeking romantic love, success, or friendship feels like a big fat lie. We learn from a young age that to be oneself, to be messy, ugly, needy, and stupid isn't lovable. Crying because we feel hurt or launching into a temper tantrum is met with the disapproval of our caretakers. Here we may hear the echoes of Jordan Peterson's parental advice. An angry child should sit by himself until he calms down. Then he should be allowed to return to normal life. That means the child wins, instead of his anger. The rule is, come be with us as soon as you can behave properly. The child learns to be accepted for not who they are, but how they are. Their worth is dictated by their behavior. Later on, we note that being too vulnerable or weird drives away romantic prospects. What we are left with is an ultimatum. You can either be yourself or you can be loved. And so our relationships become cyclical. We compromise in the beginning, prioritizing attachment over authenticity. We tuck away ourselves, repressing the emotions that feel closest to us. But this only lasts for a short while. Sooner or later, ugly truths violently crash through our frozen surface of conformity. We risk a divorce, a breakup, the severing of ties with our family members. And then, after a while, we miss the basic need of belonging, and once again repress who we are to be with others. Is this cycle an inevitability? Can we resolve the tension between authenticity and attachment? This video is sponsored by Brilliant. I'll be honest, I find math pretty boring. Statistics, even though it's super relevant to interpreting studies, can be an incredibly dry subject. Or so I thought, until I found Brilliant, that provides fun, hands-on lessons in math, science, and computer science. Interactive learning helps you learn six times more effectively than watching lecture videos. I'm especially interested in science, and I found their course on scientific essentials very compelling. The course covers essential physics concepts and definitely helped me understand the principles of light and mass. I've also been able to dip my toes in many of the other courses they offer out of pure curiosity. Whether it be relativity or neural networks, I've found the interactive and intuitive elements to be an amazing way to learn a variety of subjects. Interested in fun, interactive problem solving? Need to brush up on your math? Passionately interested in coding but don't know where to start? Join the millions of people already learning on Brilliant with a special offer just for listeners. Head to brilliant.org slash sisyphus55 to get started for free with Brilliant's interactive lessons. The first 200 listeners will also get 20% off an annual membership. Most of our tensions and frustrations stem from compulsive needs to act the role of someone we are not. This has become increasingly more evident when we look at medical research. When we think of an unhealthy personality, we tend to imagine the stressed out CEO, unwilling to make time for his family or to simply slow down. Although this type A personality has its own risks, recent studies suggest a far more insidious trait that many of us carry. As the physician Gabor Mate notes, those with a type C personality overly nice people who compulsively place others' expectations and needs ahead of their own are more likely to end up with chronic illnesses. It struck me that these patients had a higher likelihood of cancer and poorer prognosis. Repression disarms one's ability to protect oneself from stress. These highly toxic repressive personality traits include a compulsive concern for others, a rigid identification with responsibility and duty, a repression of healthy, self-protective aggression, and the consistent acting out of two main beliefs. I am responsible for how other people feel, and also, I must never disappoint anyone. Of course, none of these traits are inherently bad, but Mate notes that it is the compulsive nature of such behaviors that denotes a health risk. He explains further, these dangerously self-denying traits tend to fly under our radar because they are easily conflated with their healthy analogs. Compassion, honor, diligence, loving, kindness, generosity. One issue with being type C is that having such traits is socially desirable. 
In other words, we tend to adopt these behaviors not out of a sincere sense of compassion, but rather as a way to be liked, to feel attached and accepted. Simply put, we place our health at risk in order to be worthy of love. This may explain the overrepresentation of women with chronic illnesses, who are usually socialized at a young age to repress their emotions and satisfy the needs of others over their own. More generally, Mate explains how such a personality could develop. If our environment cannot support our gut feelings and our emotions, then the child, in order to belong and fit in, will automatically, unwittingly, and unconsciously suppress their emotions and their connections to themselves, for the sake of staying connected to the nurturing environment, without which the child cannot survive. A lot of children are in this dilemma. Can I feel and express what I feel, or do I have to suppress that in order to be acceptable, to be a good kid, to be a nice kid? The child, pretty much entirely unable to survive without social support, learns to prioritize attachment over authenticity. Learning what our parents want from us becomes an adaptive survival response, one that we maintain as we grow up. We learn that to be inauthentic is to survive. Here, Mate criticizes Peterson, who recommends punishing any outbursts from the child through isolation and scorn, teaching the child that any negative emotion is to be repressed lest they risk severance from their loved ones. As we grow older, we may develop an overly agreeable exoskeleton that surpasses any need for setting boundaries. We may also begin to internalize the aspirations of those around us, prioritizing external validation over internal validation. Better to believe it's my fault, I'm bad, which lets you believe there's the chance that if I work hard and be good, I will be lovable. Thus, even the debilitating belief in one's unworthiness begins as a coping mechanism. It becomes inconceivable that those entrusted to care for us are fundamentally bad, as our survival depends on them. Instead, we must view ourselves as inherently bad, and thus it is our job to become acceptable and consequently loved. Mate's observations echo the thoughts of Ernest Becker and Tillich, who on a much broader scale argue that there exists two ontological motives that creates an existential paradox. The need to surrender oneself in full to the rest of nature, to become a part of it by laying down one's whole existence to some higher meaning, and the need to expand oneself as an individual heroic personality. We wish to be a part of something larger, to feel like we belong, and simultaneously, we wish to be ourselves, to be authentic in our uniqueness and specialness. If we become too much of an individual, if we are too much ourselves, however, we risk the existential protection afforded to us by society and culture. To stray too far is to feel guilty. Becker notes that where religion has historically offered a solution to such a dilemma, in which God loves us for who we are and also for how so perfectly we fit into his greater design, we now seek the solution in romantic relationships. Ideally, our partner loves us uniquely for who we are and also for our contribution to this thing larger than both of us, the relationship. In the words of Mazi Starr, we strive to fade into them. This, of course, places far too much of a responsibility on the partner who becomes the moral arbiter of self-worth. Resentment and disappointment soon follow as neither can be fully themselves all in the service of the relationship. Neither can live up to such romantic expectations. And the fact that romance is so heavily prioritized by culture only further underscores the risk of a breakup. To be alone is to be unworthy. It's worth wondering how much of culture is just this, a collection of fear-based beliefs and adaptive survival identities trying to fit in. How much of our societal systems is a collective pathology based on unresolved survival responses? How do we break out of this? How do we strive to become authentic? Not in the traditional sense of finding oneself that characterizes so many self-indulgent films, but rather the capacity to be both loved and to be yourself. How can we resolve this tension? As Mate writes, the onset of inauthenticity may not be a choice, but with awareness and self-compassion, authenticity can be. In other words, we must leave blame and guilt behind. Our parents were not operating in a bubble, but were instead influenced by their sociocultural environment, 
stumbling in the dark and trying their best in their own way. Blame won't get us anywhere. Instead, it is important to recognize that our personality traits, seemingly so ingrained and essential to who we are, may simply be outdated survival mechanisms. It is sobering to realize that many of the personality traits we have come to believe are us, and perhaps even take pride in, actually bear the scars of where we lost connection to ourselves, way back when. To be self-compassionate is to grant an offering to others because you know and honor what you yourself feel. That entails genuinely listening to your gut instincts, and consequently setting boundaries. It means sensing when we are truly shaping our lives from a deep knowledge of who we are. It means honoring that little boy or girl who was told that what they felt was wrong or inappropriate. Simultaneously, it means entering into relationships where our partner accepts and understands us for who we are, encouraging us to explore and communicate our feelings rather than simply stow them away for the appropriate day that will never actually come. This is true love. People wanting what's best for each other, sincerely, all while holding each other accountable. As Mate writes, it is not only necessary to leave blame and guilt behind on the road to healing, to move from self-accusation to curiosity, from shame to responsibility, it is also and always possible. We find in our last observation that it isn't such a lie, that the only way you can be truly loved is to truly be yourself.